Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and I am silly right now. I swear, I think if I if I tried to stand up too quickly, I'd probably pass out. So I like to learn about different things. Uh, recently, after quote learning unquote guitar since like what like November, had a friend come over, hour class one day, half hour class the next day. I learned more in. 90 minutes than I did in five months. It was ridiculous. I actually understand like the fretboard, how to hit all the different chords. Like, holy shit. There's a. He explained it well. I swear. Being able to explain things is probably the most valuable skill out there. I had friends who tried to teach me how to invest for like a year several good faith efforts I didn't pick it up I was blaming myself you know what I'm blaming them because they explained it too complicated this is how I explain when I try to get people into investing and you will be shocked shocked people in their 30s 40s 50s with good income they don't have they don't have investments um, so I basically explain to them what compound interest is. I show them a chart and then I say, get this ETF, S&P 500 index fund. That's it, just do that as much money as you can and don't touch it until you retire. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, but anyway, um, the next thing I want to learn about is insulin how it works in the body. And I know, I know, I know, I appreciate it. People are gonna go in the comments and explain it. Ask yourself, have you ever explained it that way? And people understood it. Because people get so excited about something they understand, but I found that people who can explain things, uh, so um, if you have a direction or there's a YouTube video, like a video, I understand it's a broad subject, but is there like a video that's like really, really good? Because I was, I missed breakfast. I, uh, uh, oh yeah, um, Aaron finished the cover for, uh, this was yes, like yesterday. I got the pencils. I was like, all right, cool. Uh, and uh, ink's done like the next day. He's got a couple uh, pages left for Jawbreaker's uh, contingency. Should be done, I don't know, like two weeks. And then uh, almost all of it is colored already, and I only have like ten more pages to do the uh, to write the dialogue and the captions for. Uh, actually, really got into a groove with that. Um, and uh, it's uh, have you noticed like uh, Top Gun Maverick, um, Dune, some other thing recently, super successful, and like oh X Men ninety seven. Barely any jokes. That whole MCU era, <coughs> it's over. So, like, sci-fi superheroes aren't sitcoms anymore. I remember when I first started writing Jawbreakers, it was like the height of the MCU. So, I was putting all this banter in. And it was like, I think I did okay. But I wasn't really into it. Like, I like a good joke. Like, there's one joke in this book that's, like, really good. But it's not like... Banter, banter, banter. So I found, like, without that expectation to make everything funny, uh, I really enjoyed uh, writing dialogue a lot more. And it's just, like, just just uh, make it exciting. Make it punchy. Don't cover up any of the art. I wait until uh, the art is done. So I realize how much... Like, if this was a dialogue page instead of a cover... I would put the dialogue here. So it kind of limit it to like right here and I don't want to like cover this. So if he said anything it would just be like a hmm and it would just be like right here. Um, in this case it's it's a cover and uh, Aaron was asking like uh, how much real estate should I leave for the logo and I was like none. I mean with Jawbreakers Lost Souls I just put the logo like right up here in the corner so that's that's fine. Anyway before I go First Kill graphic novel, link is in the description. First Kill is at the printer. Lots of things are at the printer. Rock and Roll Ninja 
it has been printed, is being fulfilled. I've already got people um, uh, saying they got it. So this, uh, about two weeks ago, Heidi announced that the beat is 20 years old in 2024, but it's like July. I don't, I don't know why you, I don't know why. It feels like this article should come out on January 1st that the beat is going to turn 20 years old this year or July 1st. I don't think that's an OCD thought. I think it's just really strange. It's like, okay, March 11th, whatever. So she's very, very excited about her corrupt website lasting for 20 years. But she wants to, to last forever. In fact, she wants her corrupt take, her propaganda on the comic book industry to become the history of it. So um, the beat is 20 years old in 2024. So much coffee. Um, so it goes on for a while and uh, I might <laughs> I might pass out. Um, but she goes over a, a history of the uh, of the website, how many posts, how many conventions she's gone to says it started during the golden age of blogging. She keeps using this phrase in quotes, but I'm the only... She's the only person I've ever seen use this phrase. It's kind of like when Howard Chaikin is like, somebody called me a neutered butler of the SJW left. And like, you said that. You say that about yourself. You, you say this quote. Nobody can find this quote. Nobody can find any permutation of anyone ever calling you that, Howard, except for you. Um, uh, so uh, it started on uh, Comic-Con.com. Who cares? Um, but where it works uh, at Publishers uh, Weekly. But where it gets really interesting is she starts to point out that... So she says... Um, I've gone to great personal expense, financial and energy-wise, to keep the beat online, at least from 2006 on. She sold it, and then she's either bought it back, or it looks like they just like were like, we don't want this anymore, you can have it back. The first few years are gone, alas, but archived on my personal backup drives in patchy form. The effect is often embarrassing. Personal growth and tolerance are part of the lesson around here, but it's a rolling record. I'm very proud of. I believe there's something of value in what we do here. Um, so then she starts talking about this. Uh, it's basically own your own website, so it can't be shut down. Um, so uh, she says, somehow a scrappy little indie like the beat struggled through the storm of lots of other other corrupt websites uh, shutting down. Will we make it through the current hail and rain and pivoting? The thing is, the beat never really pivoted. We're just a blog featuring good writing, passionate writers and readers, and a little ad money thrown in along the way. And somehow, for 20 years, it's worked. I think it will continue to work and there's even talk of a comeback for blogging. As we kick off, okay, so blah, 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 blah. So I think I skipped uh, one part, or maybe it was just kind of like reading. Oh, okay, so here it is. Um, I know we live in a world where the whole economy is based on creating something cool, selling it, watching it get destroyed, and moving on uh, to the next thing. That idea doesn't appeal to me. And it doesn't make sense for the mission at the beat either. The mission. I've mentioned this many times before, but the history of comics as told on the web is highly... I've always pronounced this infamirial, but it looks like infamirial. Infamirial, not infamirial. The, uh, whatever you call the millennial decade, the 2000s, have been particularly hard hit. Newsarama's archives are long gone. CBRs exist but are hard to find. The Comics Reporter stands as an archive, thank God, but most of my other contemporaries are gone. 
Journalista, Comics Bulletin, and so on. So, I believe, and again, I understand if you're like, I don't get it. It's, it's one of those things where you do have to read between the words. But there's always been a question, like, because Heidi has always been around. She was writing, like, the, the final page in uh, uh, Amazing Heroes. When I was in high school, and I'm 50, uh, it was written by her. It was kind of like a listicle. It was kind of like light humor. It was fun. And then she worked at various places in the 1990s. And then comics publishers stopped hiring her. And then for 20 years, she's been a reporter, but like a very strange reporter. Like when everyone was jumping in on the digital lynch mob against Warren Ellis, she did as well, except for she had old blog posts from that time period where she was like, I love to hang out on the Warren Ellis forums. Uh, too bad there's so many skanks here. Basically is what she said. And then 20 years later, they were saints. They were, no, she, it's almost like she said, no, I said saints, not skanks. She didn't use the word skanks, but basically she said groupies or words to that effect. I've done a video on it before. Um, but, uh, Everyone was always curious. It's like, she's been around. She was never that great. Nobody ever really cared. Like, she had a site, but nobody ever went to Comics Beat. Like, so the question is, why does she stay around so long? And why did she become so damn corrupt? And I think, again, you have to kind of read between the words. I think she had a vague plan. She said, yeah, I don't really get a lot of views but I'm just going to not quit and eventually all of this angel investor money all of this investment all of this oh vice just got investment for 200 billion dollars whatever that crazy stuff that used to happen that's going to end and I'm going to be the only source for what is happening and what happened in the industry. I think if you wanted to work in comics, like she obviously did, but then your uh, career essentially evaporated before you were 40, but it was your peer group. You weren't really good at anything else. You didn't have anything else. I think this was not the initial plan, I think it was just like, oh, nobody wants to hire me. I'll start my own website and I'll be invited to conventions and I'll get interviews and maybe something will happen and nothing really happened. And I think at some point, especially around 50, like, uh, like I'm going to go see a concert this weekend in another state. That used to be the type of thing I would say like, oh, I'll see them one day. But I did that in the 1990s with Frank Sinatra and I missed his final tour. I did that with my favorite, well, actually it wasn't my fault, it was COVID. Uh, with my favorite band, the Detroit Cobras, uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to see them. And then COVID happened, got delayed, 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 and then the lead singer OD'd. Except for, I was a fan of them for like a decade before COVID started, and they toured a lot. So it's like, I had, I had the chance. So this isn't even like... A musician I like a lot. I just got into her stuff. I was like, okay, where, where, where is she playing? Because a lightning bolt is probably going to hit her ass. So I'm going to go see her now. But what I'm trying to say is, once you hit 50, you're like, I either do things or I don't do things. It's not like, oh, I'm going to plan. Oh, one day. <laughs> no, like, go look up the tour schedule. Uh, okay, there. Okay, book it. All right, there. Go. Um, but I think somehow, and this would have happened when she was in her 50s, she's like, oh, shit. Everyone's kind of dropping out. It's like if you ever saw The Simpsons when uh, Grandpa Simpson, he was in a tontine, which was like everyone splits uh, or uh, they have a treasure, but they don't split it up. And the idea is the the last person alive gets it all. 
So I think she sees this as some sort of uh, journalistic historical tontine. She just has to outlast as the industry shrinks. Like, can you imagine, like, some angel investor? It's like, oh, we're going to invest $10 million in a comic book news website. Like, what the fuck? So her plan is, like, she's just going to... And with search engine optimization, one of the factors is just, like, how long has the website been in operation? So she has that advantage of going to the top of, not the very top, but towards the top of uh, searches. So I think she's just like, I'm just going to outlast everyone. And holy shit, women in the West live fucking forever now. Women who never even take care of themselves live until their 90s. So she could have another 30 years. And so she just puts what the fuck ever. She shakes the tin cup every time she runs out of money for the, for the server fees. And her goal is to be the, the website of record for the industry. So all that success on Indiegogo didn't happen. Cancel culture? Nope. Uh, why was there a collapse of the industry? Uh, paper shortage, recession, COVID. Yeah, that was it. Nothing else. Even, do you remember at the end of the year where she did that, uh, uh, what was it, like a retailer's roundup? And they identified that, like, quality and enthusiasm were a problem. But in a very, very long article, she said, we don't have time to cover that here. The enthusiasm problem of getting customers into stores, the quality of when they buy it, they want to buy more. When uh, the, uh, I know there were multiple ends to the, uh, to the, the lockdown, but I think it was like 2022 was like, like the official, like it's over. And then, but people were still getting those COVID checks. So there was this huge spike in sales of everything at comic book stores. And do you remember Heidi McDonald was all like, neener, neener. Oh, those chuds. Nee, 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 nee. Yeah, okay. Mags is literally like, can I get a housing lawyer? Well, why do you want one? Mags, what happened? You didn't pay your rent. You're being evicted. Or they are raising the rent and you can't afford it. At least, as far as we know, your teeth aren't falling out like your peers. So that whole... Neener, neener act from a 60 year old woman in 2020 because sales went up because people are like, holy shit, I can leave the house. Shops are open and yet I'm still getting these COVID check, COVID checks. What happened is they bought a bunch of floppies and then they read them. And then all of those gains from 2022 were lost in 2023 it's been it's almost the end of march now it's been almost three months and you've never had quote time to talk about the self-admitted quality and enthusiasm problems in the industry and she's not going to because she's corrupt but we finally have a super villain origin why is she just went from like a nothing just like whoever like I remember it was like right when Diamond was having all their problems and they were on uh, a podcast and she was there for some reason and uh, uh, what is his name Jeppy he was just going through it you just saw the stress on his face and like like his whole empire was collapsing and then Heidi was like, hey, Steve, remember me? We were at the CBR yacht party 15 years ago. And he just had this look like, bitch, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, the company I've built for 30 years is collapsing. And some fat chick is like, do you remember we were at a party together when George Bush was president? Like, what the fuck? So I think it was just like she didn't know what to do and then it was just like a social thing like hang out on the 
Warren Ellis uh, skank infested forums and then just like oh I'm a journalist sort of so I get invited to parties um, but at some point it looks like in her 50s she's like oh shit everything's collapsing but you know I don't pay the people who work on my website all I have to do is pay some hosting fees holy shit I might be the last word on the industry the history you know they say that history is written by the victors well she saw a loophole she's like my victory can just be that I don't die or become homeless which is a recurring problem in the industry so she's like holy shit I'm a white woman in a Western country I never took care of my health and I'm gonna live to be fucking 95 Freaking, uh, uh, what's it called? Social Security kicks in for Heidi. I think what what was what is the deal? If you can actually start getting the benefits when you're 62, but uh, if you wait till you're 67, you get more benefits. Like if you if you if you start dipping in early, you get less per month, something like that. But whatever. She's like a year away from being able to get social security so she's like shit I'm gonna get social security in like one year so she's just gonna ride it out and just whatever happens it's kinda like opposite day <laughs> like you just you just lie you just type lies and you pay your uh, your bill to godaddy.com or whatever is the hosting service for this website and that's it so that's the plan. She wants to write the final word. So one of the things I've been thinking of is I do think YouTube is going to last. Um, but not forever. You know, a better app will come along and people will use that and they won't want to transfer everything over. So I really do think that there needs to be physical printed copies of what happened. There are several phases in comic book history that I think, I used to think like, that should be a movie. Like there was this period where Marvel Comics was literally like a closet. It had shrunk so much, it was Stan Lee and a secretary, and I think they were just doing reprints, and also they were in this weird like humiliating deal where like, they were only allowed to put out like something like eight books because a rival was was helping them somehow I think with distribution or something like that so I mean it was just just shrunk like to me that was like a great I mean Will Eisner used to do stuff like this he would talk about the studio era Howard Chaikin he just wasted everyone's time with that Romana Clef I'm gonna tell all about like it was just airing dirty laundry but like there was no joy in it and then also like only an insider would know who he was referencing the only one who I could tell who it was was the avatar for himself that was pretty easy and the avatar for Gil Kane but, like other ones like you couldn't even tell from the name or the physicality you had to read like oh this is supposed to be like Stanley like just Stan Lee is literally a, a historical figure. You can just write a book about him. I've got this awful Tom Scioli hagiography of Jack Kirby. I think it's just completely useless. So doing the whole warts and all cynical thing that Howard Chaikin did, that's fucking worthless. These Tom Scioli, Jack Kirby, and Stan Lee, and they have like anime eyes. Like, what the fuck? But I really think it's time to for comics to start like covering itself and putting down like what happened so like Stan and a secretary like operating out of a closet and just like all hope is lost and then I would just get to like the beginning of the the Marvel age um, uh, Jim Shooter I mean that's basically if you saw the movie Whiplash I wouldn't cover his time at Marvel 
it would be when he was at DC and just getting just just cooked by his editor, and he's like in high school. <coughs> um, uh, other eras, the 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 Marvel Knights, Joe Quesada. As much as I don't like that guy, the way he saved Marvel and the entire industry is just is just amazing. And um, I think this era. Although we don't really know, like this is the like the end of like the SJW cancel culture decade, but it doesn't quite have that like like I'm kind of thinking it's X Men ninety seven. I think X Men ninety seven made X Men cool for like the first time since Grant Morrison was writing it. Massive audience. I think that might be the thing. Oh, by the way, I have a theory about Bo and Mayo. Which is a fun name to say, Bo de Mayo. Bo de Mayo. All of the theories is that he did something wrong. What if he got let go because he did something right? What if they hired him because it's like, oh, it's the X-Men, but of course we can't have a white guy. Well, they didn't have a white guy last time. There was a black guy as a showrunner in the 1990s. So they're just like, oh, gay and black, that's perfect. And they didn't realize like he was really good. And they're like, oh, fuck. We've just been hiring random lesbians. Like, oh, we don't know how to handle this. I don't, I don't know about this. Um, so I'm thinking maybe he, like, kind of like last minute, maybe he threatened a little. Like, oh, this happened to me and I'm going to do interviews about it if you don't give me, like, some sort of massive raise. Or maybe he tried to, like, claim the X-Men movie franchise like hey I did a lot and uh, what's his name over at Star Wars like he worked on Clone Wars Dave Filoni and now he's he's getting movies so wh uh, what he's he's a straight white guy and I'm a, I'm a gay black guy like I don't know that's literally just a theory just from air but like I mean it's so fucking good you should see on TikTok like it's an entire generation discovering a franchise and just loving it um, so uh, a lot of topics here although I guess the the overall theme is legacy um, what will we leave behind for Heidi her plan which she didn't think through because nobody wants to carry this torch <laughs> what she's gonna be 90 in a hospice and someone's like I will <laughs> Pay the hosting fees for your website full of lies. Like, no. She's going to die. The hosting fees aren't going to be paid. And the whole website's going to disappear, like, two months after she croaks. Now, again, she's a white woman in a Western country. Those motherfuckers are almost goddamn immortal. Holy shit, nothing kills them. We should start drafting them. They're not very good, but we could just keep them in war for like 50 fucking years. They never fucking die. Yeah, like 80, 90. It's, it's like nothing. It's, it's nothing uh, uh, for Western women these days to, to live until their 90s. Holy shit. So uh, we're going to have to deal with Heidi McDonald for a while. Jeez. Um, she's going to outlive me. Uh, but... Uh, I do think it's time that people and don't God, don't don't make it one-sided like have some freaking integrity tell both sides just don't be like so did I tell you we were awesome like I always whenever people do like funny oh there's a what is it heels versus baby face is live okay so um uh, whenever people do like funny political books I'm always like you know do you remember like the 1980s and they would have like Ronnie's Raiders <laughs> isn't that funny it's Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill and they're like Rambo Captain isn't that funny you know the time you spent doing that was the same amount of time that Eastman and Laird spent on the first issue of Ninja Turtles around the same time frame like why would you it just feels like a huge waste I know not everything's gonna be 
as successful as Ninja Turtles, but what was the plan? Like, that's, oh, oh my God, Tip O'Neill? That's hilarious! Dan Rost, like, is that from a different, I, I don't really know politicians that well. They always have, like, politician names. Dan Rostenkowski. He's like Bucky. Isn't that funny? No, it's not. Not at all. Um, uh, but what I'm trying to say, and I'm... Jeez. It's weird. Like, so many years of the coughing being a problem, and now the not coughing is a problem because I just talk fucking forever. Um, 30 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up. So, um, comics matter. Um, I don't know why you would waste your time doing some topical stuff that's not going to have any relevance to future generations um uh heidi mcdonald broke bad a few years ago uh i believe because she saw like oh i can actually have a lasting effect on the comic book industry i can write its obituary and that's just going to be how it is oh uh there was a uh a, a paper shortage uh there was a staple it wasn't a shortage but Staples just got weird. We're not going to talk about it. We don't have time. Staples got weird. And then there was a, there was a recession, and uh, they ran out of milk, and there was a, there was a, there was a pandemic, and, yeah, and, it, and it ended. Um, so, uh, okay, so we have a, a method to the madness. Uh, Heidi McDonald, sorry. Corrupt journalist Heidi McDonald wants uh, her legacy to be the legacy she wants to write the legacy of the uh, American comic book industry. A bunch of bullshit. Uh, anyway, I'm getting a call. Thanks for watching. Bye.